Hey, welcome back everyone to this week's study, Colossians 2, 1 through 5. We are looking at uh, 1 through 3 today and talking about an understanding and knowledge. So, this passage begins with, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. The word for connects this idea back to the previous sentence where, where Paul said he struggles with all the energy of Christ. That sentence also begins with 4, which connects it back to verse 28, where Paul says that he proclaims Christ with warning and teaching so that he could present everyone mature in Christ. This struggle of Paul has to do with his evangelism to the lost and his training of believers in the knowledge of the faith. He uses the word struggle, which would have had a very specific connotation in the minds of his first century readers. The struggle, or the agona, was the name of the place where you would assemble to watch the games. It was also used as the games themselves. You would go see the Agona. The Agona were contents of strength and intellect. The games were designed to break even the strongest of contestants. And history records that many of the people did break as they were participating in the games. Agona is obviously where our English word agony comes from. When the Colossians and Laodiceans read this letter, they would understand exactly what Paul is feeling. He is in a contest, a battle of strength and will on their behalf. He labors over them in his thoughts and prayers. Many of you know what this means. Your concern for others consumes your thoughts and you can't stop thinking about them. Your emotions are tied up in those thoughts. And the enemy often takes advantage of the struggle and adds his temptations and pressures to that situation. It's a real struggle that consumes time and physical energy. This is where Paul was, and not only for those in the cities that he knew, but also for those who he had not seen face to face. Paul had a real concern for all believers, whether he personally knew them or not. And so he writes to them because he wants their hearts to be encouraged. They are not alone. Even if they had never met Paul, he was with them. He was in the arena of prayer for them. They can be encouraged because not only do they have Paul on their side, but they have each other. They were knit together in love. This is true of all believers. John, in his first letter, makes the same argument. Christians love and are commanded to keep loving each other. That is the reality. If you don't love the brothers, you don't love Christ. You don't know God. If you're not knit together in love with the people of the church, then you don't know Jesus. For you language nerds out there, the, the verb knit is an aorist tense, which means that it's a past singular event, that you have been knit. The Christians are not currently being knit. They were knit together. Their lives are intertwined. What great encouragement we can take from this. This is a real unity. But this unity is to lead to something, though. They have been knit together, but it leads, it's going somewhere. Why are they knit together in love? Well, Christians are unified so that they reach all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Look at the heaping of phrases here. It's not that we just have assurance, but full assurance. And it's not just full assurance, but all the riches of full assurance. This assurance is the assurance of understanding and knowledge of Christ. Remember that the word mystery in the Bible refers to something that was hidden, but since has been revealed. This does not mean that there is something in the doctrine of our faith that our uh, unintelligible or incomprehensible that you must acquire through some secret knowledge. That's what some people taught. Some people still believe today. It does mean, though, that the doctrines of the Christian faith have been made plain to all people by God. They were hidden, but now they've been revealed. They are open to anyone with the spiritual ability to comprehend. Christians have this ability and are to grow in the full assurance of understanding and wisdom. Paul makes a bold statement that in Jesus we find all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What an exclusive statement that is. If you want wisdom or knowledge, you have to go to the storehouse, the vault, 
where they are hidden and kept safe. Where are these treasures at? In Christ alone. So let's bring all this together. Paul is struggling for the Colossians and Laodicean Christians that they might be encouraged because they are already knit together in love so that they would have a complete understanding and knowledge of Christ who is the source of all wisdom and knowledge. This is the idea fleshed out by Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, 6-16. through The natural man only has knowledge of things that he can see and only can speculate on the spiritual. He cannot comprehend the spiritual nor truly understand the spiritual. Paul says the Christians have the mind of Christ. Paul also says all this in order that no one would delude them with plausible arguments. This is obviously a reference to the false teachers that are amongst them that are teaching bad theology. They have come with persuasive speeches that are intended to draw them away from the truth and from each other. They know the source of all wisdom and knowledge. They are to have full assurance of this understanding of knowledge in Jesus. They are not to allow these frauds to sway them from what they already know. These persuasive speeches with their plausible arguments would only lead to division. But the full assurance of the knowledge found in Christ would keep them unified and strong. This is the argument behind the entire letter of 1 Corinthians. True knowledge unifies, but lack of knowledge divides. So it is of utmost importance for us to study, to grow in our knowledge of the mystery of the full riches of assurance in Jesus Christ. So, we have to be studying. We have to learn. We have to know. That's the, the truth here. And we do that by the Word of God, not by all these plausible arguments that are coming outside the Word of God. Our 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 you know, constant saying should be, well, prove it from the Word of God. Prove it from the Bible. Show me in the Word. Chapter and verse. Prove me. Prove it to me. That should be something we constantly say. If someone says, well, God told me that this. Prove it from the Bible. Prove it. Show it. If you can't do that, then I'm not listening to your arguments. I'm not listening to what you're saying. you got to show it to me from the Scriptures. That should be our constant Constant saying. Because if you can't, then I don't know where it's coming from. But I can have the full assurance of the knowledge and wisdom that's found in Christ, which is found in His Word. I can go there and find all the wisdom and knowledge. I don't need to go anywhere else. I don't need anything else. So prove it. That's what we should be about. That's what we should be doing. So come back next time. We'll move on to the next part and see what else Paul has for us. 